All right, so we are going to get started now. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, for this session, we're going to be doing two parts. One of the first part is going to be a couple of tips and tricks and troubleshooting hints for um, race day scoring. So I com compiled a few of the common things that like Chris and Kevin and myself see happen over the weekend um, at events that uh, could have a really fast resolution. Um, I wanted to let you guys know, or everyone in the room know that we, we go through all of the stuff that comes in on the weekend. We try to you know, see if we can, one, identify if there's a real bug. If it is, we get it right to the development team. We get it into a fix that week. If it's something that we can just make an improvement so they don't wind up in that situation, we talk about it, figure out a feature we could add to make it better in the future. But um, the point of that is to say, if you do encounter something that you like, even if it wasn't like, it didn't, wasn't a showstopper for you, but it was just like, oh, you sat there, you were like, oh, I wish it was doing this and it was doing that. Shoot us a note, let us know. We read through everything. We make note of absolutely everything. And if we can improve it, we'll let you know that we made a change to improve your, you know, how you're operating on race site. Cause that's what we want to do. So a best thing you can do is just let us know, shoot us a note, say like, use that help area to say, Hey, I was trying to do this thing. And I felt like I could have, I should have been able to do it this way, but I, I had to do it this other way. And it took me way longer. This is the kind of feedback that we love to hear. So, um, well, I'm saying that because Chris or Kevin or myself will probably give you an in the moment fix, like, Hey, just do this thing. It's not to say that we aren't going to make it better in the future. It's to get you on the right track right now so that your race can have results today. But we definitely are thinking about how we can improve it in the future. Um, so that's going to be the first part. Second part is going to be Roger's going to be doing some updates on the race director, um, a few cool new utilities he's been making lately, and just updates about the software and the process in general uh, going forward with race director. So let's get started. It's going to be a light presentation, and I'm just going to give you like bullet points if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. If this happens, do that. And I'll show you a little bit in the software as well. But um, I'm hoping that we'll have a good amount of time for questions at the end as well today. So if we have any you know, questions about things that you run into, um, and we can definitely help you out with that. So uh, yeah, best practices, common issues, and troubleshooting. So these are some of the main things that we see come up, especially with newer timers, but also with folks who have been using it for a while. Number one, why aren't my reads coming in to race day scoring? This is like first thing you do, right? When you're setting up for the very first time, like nothing's working. What the heck is going on? Second one, why are my raw reads being ignored? Okay, so I've got the reads. I see the numbers going up, but there's no results. What the heck? Next, my reports don't look right. Very vague question, but like I get it and it happens. You're like, this isn't right. These fields, these times don't look accurate. It's a very broad question, but we have some um, things that will hopefully help in troubleshooting. Some data isn't syncing from run sign up. Either you know it's not updating in my app or something I changed in my app isn't going to run sign up, or my results aren't publishing to run sign up completely. So these are like the big problems, big showstoppers that um, you need resolution for on race day, especially. So there's a lot of things that could be. Um, these are some of the most common things that we have. So I'm going to give you some quick tips on how to manage them. And also hopefully teach you a little bit about how the software works. So um, why aren't the raw reads coming into race day scoring? The number one thing I get, and this is, it seems silly when you've been using it for a while, but for a new timer, um, sometimes they don't understand. They need to have that indicator at the top. It says reads needs to be green. And so many times it's just, you're in the heat of the moment and you're not thinking and you haven't started collecting reads yet. So if you aren't seeing anything come in, just double check, make sure it's green, you're good to go. That's a big one. And it happens like and you send an email out like, is the connector running? Is the reads green? You don't get a response back and you know that they're like, no. <laughs> this is another big one. So with race day scoring, we have file streams and we have direct streams. Direct streams, uh, well, both of them kind of vary by hardware manufacturer. One thing in common with direct streams is you usually have to have some kind of location identifier or something to say like in your middleware where you're connecting from like fusion or timing and scoring or whatever, you have some way of identifying a reader or a collection of readers. So in timing and scoring for my laps, you have location names, you have your start, your finish, your split with 
a few readers within each maybe. And in race day scoring, when you set up your streams, you have to make sure that you match the name exactly. And a lot of times you'll get things where people will have it off by a letter or they, they thought they, you know, used the same format from the previous race, but, you know, it's not, it's not uh, exactly the same. Instead of start slash finish, it's start hyphen finish or something like that. So this is a really good thing to double check. And that's in your stream setup. You are putting in a, um, a label for that, a location or whatever it's called for your hardware. That's a big one. Um, another one is if it's a file stream, you have to make sure the folder location is correct in the stream setup and that there's actually a file in there. So what we see a lot of the time is a timer will say, I have the file in the folder that I'm pointing to, but nothing's coming in. And what we'll, we'll ask them, like, take a screenshot of this directory. We'll, we'll paste that directory of like the, the stream that they have set up and they'll go to it. And there's like another folder underneath it with the file inside of it. And it's like, when we, when we do this, we don't mean to be like, Hey, you're doing something stupid. It's more just like, I need you to verify this. Cause like it's, it's probably just something very simple. And usually it's the case that they have like a finish folder and then like a subfolder called finish and then the files in that. So if you're not seeing reads on a stream for a file, go to that directory, exactly that directory and look at it and see if there's actually any files in there. And maybe you need to go one more folder deep. So that's a big one. And additionally, this is kind of related. If you uh, check the notifications panel in the top right, there's a notifications area and it'll glow red if there's notifications there. It will tell you if there's problems with the, uh, especially with file, if you are um, collecting data that is in the, not in the right format. So the way that file streams work is that it looks at a folder and it takes all the data in the folder and tries to use it as read data. So if you happen to have result PDFs and a bunch of other random files in this folder you're looking at, it's gonna try and process those. So it might give you errors about other things in there. So the best thing I can say is make sure to have that a clean folder on race day. The only thing in there is gonna be your result files. Now there's ways to filter it. You can say only look at text files and things, but I just like to keep it completely clean. Now, if you see this unsupported file stream, unable to parse errors, that's something that James put in there and it's too developer language, I'm sorry. But um, basically what it means is that it got a file that in a different format, the columns aren't what we are expecting to see. And it'll tell you like what the columns are that you see in there. And it'll be different from what your stream setup is. So if you see that, it just means that this is some kind of file that I'm not expecting to see in this folder. It may be the case that it's a, you know, different, completely not even a timing file, or it may be the case that you're using an exporter from your middleware and it's not defined the right way or something. So if you see that, it's just basically this file that I'm looking at doesn't look correct to me. We need to resolve that issue. Now this one, it will say there's an unknown hardware name that pops up. What you'll typically see is like, let's say you've got timing and scoring running. You have a start, a finish, and a split location. Those three are connected to a single exporter in timing and scoring in my laps. And in race day scoring, I connect to that one TCP IP exporter, and I have three locations, let's say, start, finish, and checkpoint. Now, let's say I um, didn't actually create the checkpoint one. I just had start and finish, but I had the checkpoint location and timing and scoring. So what's going to happen is you'll get some notifications that'll say, hey, I see reads coming from this checkpoint that I don't know what to do with. So all it's telling you is that I'm getting data that isn't being used anywhere. It's like, I've got data coming in that I don't know what to do with. May not be an issue. You might not need to use it. But if you see this, um, that's what it's talking about. It's saying that I don't, I don't know what to do with this because there's no location reference in race day scoring for it. Any questions on these? So now let's say we got our raw reads in, but they're being ignored. You got red on that screen, whole thing's red. What's going on? Number one thing that happens is filtered by time. And I get questions like, what, what does that mean? I don't know what you're talking about, filtered by time. 
Um, times and race day scoring are, as we've seen um, downstairs, Chris showed you if you were there, I use it with product much, um, is all by location. So I have my start and my finish. My start, I collect times until some certain time. My finish, I collect times after some certain time. And this means that uh, I encountered a read that's outside that filter. So I define something that says only accept start reads until 10 a.m. And I got one at 10.03. It's going to ignore it and say it's filtered by time. So most typically what will happen here is you have like the wrong date set. For instance, you have um, a most typically, I guess it would be a uh, finished location set to start uh, collecting reads tomorrow. So everything's going to get filtered out until tomorrow. That's not good. So you have to go into location and make sure that that date is set correctly. This is the first thing I check when I see filtered by time. I go in, I double check, see if the locations are filtering out. If that doesn't work, I usually go and check the start time, make sure my start time is on the right day. Usually that's not a problem. And AM, PM is a big one. Oh, that's the worst. And, and I, I feel that's another one of those ones where I, like we send a screenshot and like, are you sure it's not AM you mean here? And they respond, yeah. <laughs> but it does happen uh, quite a bit. Um, so uh, this is a note. If you do change these filtering rules, this is one of the things where you would have to use that recalculate raw reads function. You don't have to use that for much. Chris was saying how he loves to just do it all the time. And I kind of cringe at that. The, the only time you really need to do it is if this filtering changes. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you have to change your locations, basically the recalculate function, that's saying, okay, I've got my raw reads and I want to reprocess with the new filtering rule. So you could change your filters then go back and recalculate and it reprocesses the raw reads. Recalculate doesn't like go back to the file and bring it back in. It's saying I've already got the reads. I want to reprocess the filters to the reads. Unknown bidder chip, I think we all know what this means. Um, it's just that I don't have a reference for this. Um, Chris mentioned on the uh, run this morning, he was saying how um, you have to make sure if you have a cross-reference that your cross-reference, if you can't just do a single change, unfortunately, it has to be absolutely everyone. And we give you a nice way to do a one-to-one -one cross-reference to cover everybody else. If it's just like, hey, bib two lost their chip and they had to wear chip 1002, you can change one, you know, 1000 to 1002 or whatever I said, and then you can use one-to-ones for everyone else. But this is, this can happen quite a bit. You have to be very careful. We give you a notification if there's anyone in the race who doesn't have a chip cross-reference, if one person does, to tell you, you need to go set up a cross-reference. So this is really important. So why, why should you do that? Yeah, so this is why, because what we find is that people will chain cross-references. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're doing a MyLapse bib tag race. And um, so bib one is actually wearing chip 100. What will happen is you get to a point where you now have bib 100 wearing chip 200. And when we used to have it operate where it would use either bib or chip, but it would use bib first, it would get confused at that point because it would then say, oh, 100, I've got a bib for that. I'm going to use that, but it really should have been 200. So anyway, it's a, it's a confusing thing. Rogers had to do that in race director as well for the same reason, um, because it, when you start to, it, it's really simple for like IPCO where the chips are X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, seven, whatever. But with the bibs, being different, you can get it to a point where you don't know which one's correct, and which one to use, if you're only applying some of them. So, yeah, the problem is if you get two people with like, like you use 100, chip 100 to bib one, what happens with bib 100 now? You know what I mean? Are you going to get two results for the same person? I know it happens. <laughs> I 
this is the override normal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just very annoying that I'm doing a whole page change class on the one version of the app that it is. Yep. Yeah, so that's why we have the one-to-one -one thing. It's it's not that difficult to do that and say one through one thousand is the same. It's just a little thing to do. Okay. So moving on. Some more ignored reasons for our reads. This no event for bib is one that is super confusing, and I haven't found a better name for it yet. People tend to think that uh it's like, oh, this means this person's not assigned to an event. And it's not what it actually means. What it means is that it finds a participant based on the bib or chip, and then it looks at their event. So Matt Avery ran across, and I see that Matt Avery ran, for, ran the 5K. And let's say that this is a, at the 10K split location. So what it's saying is that I don't see Matt's event being used with this location. It's saying that the 10K split isn't used in the 5K. So this event doesn't make any sense at this location. So basically this, if this happens, it, you have to check to see then is it being used in segments for the event that the person is registered for? <laughs> so it's like, just it's usually the case that it's, I got a 5K crossing the half marathon split, or I set up an announcer segment or something like you're not gonna use for scoring, or you didn't set up an announcer segment, you set up an announcer timing location, but you didn't apply it to any segments, it's gonna ignore everything. You have to actually set it up as a segment in order for you to get reads into it. So this one will happen um, and it's a little bit hard to explain, but that, that's what it is. Just you have to make sure that that is actually a valid event for that location. Later segment already completed. This is a little known setting on the segment setup. If you're, no, if you're scoring a triathlon, you may want to use this. You may not want to use it. You should check it out, see how it works. Basically what it does is it, it, it has the order of segments based on the cumulative distance of the segments. So it, it knows when you set it up that the transition one ends at 0.2 miles, um, or let's just say swim ends at 0.2 miles, transition one ends at 0.2 miles as well, bike ends at 20.2 miles, Transition two ends at 20.2 miles, and then the run ends at 23.2 miles. And it orders based on that. If you enable a setting on the segments to say, or I can't remember what the actual setting is, it's basically prevent reads from earlier segments. What will happen is it will, if a segment, like let's say the swim got completed, and then they go on and do the rest of the um, event, if they come back around to the swim reader for any reason, if they got picked up again, um, we don't want that to get like reread. So um, it really only happens if they were to have missed the swim exit. So they didn't get a read there, but they got their bike splits and everything else. And they came back around and got their swim read accidentally. That would be the case where you'd want to try to ignore it because a later segment was already completed. So it really is only useful if you happen to have missed reads early on and you want to prevent them from getting triggered later. But that may happen to you um, if you see that. Um, it just means that, hey, this is a read for a segment, but I already got later segments completed, so I'm ignoring it. Enabled. Setting enabled, yep. Um, but some people will just like enable it, not thinking. And they'll be like, what's going on? Everything's ignored double check those might be you didn't set it up quite right or the order of your finishes is wrong and that you got to figure out yourself <laughs> like your splits are maybe more more uh um yeah wrong well, that's reader. more that's more likely for this is if uh like in a marathon at the five mile mark your your system was down for some reason for an extended period of time so lots of people didn't get a read and then uh, then it comes up, and unfortunately, it's close to the course as they're coming back. Yeah. So you want to make sure that those people that had a mystery, because that could be a big problem. Yep. So I, th I think that was the use case that drove yeah. this. Uh, That's a really good use case, yeah. They missed the first split, and they come back around, and they might trigger it because they're running alongside right. it or something. That's a really good, yeah. good one. 
Shoot. The question is, yeah, the question is when you recalculate, will it reprocess the reads in a different order than which they came in? We, we don't actually care about the order that the reads came into the system at. We order more, we care more about like the time of day that they happened at. So it doesn't matter what order things come in on. It's more, we process it based on the time of day of the read itself. So it shouldn't change anything. Okay, so data not syncing with race day scoring. This is a common question. Basically, the way that syncing works with run sign up is it's two steps. With any kind of syncing process, it's two steps. The first step is tell me about the race. The second step is give me the data about the race. So the first step is saying, okay, this is the race name. These are the different events that are included in it. These are the custom questions that are out there. These are the corrals that are out there. The second part is give me all the participant data and that keeps syncing in the background. Give me all the teams that keep syncing in the background. So the first step doesn't automatically refresh and refresh and refresh. So let's say you are setting up a race and race day scoring. And then later on, uh, you go and you add a new registration event. That isn't going to pop into race day scoring like it's a new participant. I don't know what that's, up, what that's with, but um, so, that's not going to come into race day scoring like a new participant because it's not like you're adding events all the time and expecting them to show up in real time. So we don't do that automatic processing. So for things like events or corrals or team types, you need to force a sync and tell the system, yes, I want to get an update. Now this does happen if you like unload and reload the race or things like that. But this is that thing. If you go to the participant sync area and save sync settings, that tells it, give me a new update of all the stuff about the race, all of the corrals, all of the events. So if you go into participant sync and save sync settings, that tell, gets a refresh of the structure of the race. So if you are like, hey, I got a new event added, but I don't see it in race day scoring, go to participant sync and save sync settings, boom, it'll show up in there. Um, a participant or a team isn't syncing, why? There may be something with the data that's causing an error, check notifications error. So usually it's like something is improperly formatted, like somehow they got a bad email address in there. We try to prevent bad data from getting in in any way. But what will happen is like run sign up has a very strict rules about like phone numbers must be this format, emails must be this format, otherwise they just bonk out an error. So we try to like prevent you from typing something in incorrect. But sometimes something weird happens. It got an import that got processed wrong and it wound up in there. So if you see anything about bad uh, data that got into the system, it probably will get stuck in the sync queue. So this sync queue is in the participant sync area. And it's basically like the check-in app where it's got changes trying to push and it's never going to push them. So you have to fix the problem, correct the email address or the phone number or whatever. The system will tell you what the problem is. And then go to this sync queue and there'll be a couple of things in there. You got to delete them all out and then sync again and you'll be good to go. So it's basically just that sync queue. You'll see the edits that were made that are invalid and you just have to delete them and it'll go right through again. It doesn't happen too frequently. John race site. Sync failed, sync failed, sync failed, sync failed. Sync failed. <laughs> if you ever see the red sync failed, sync failed, sync failed, sync failed. Sync failed. Just go to the um, into this participant sync, show sync queue, and delete out those pending syncs, and you should be good to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is I have wheelchair division, and I want to publish a new result set for them. There's no event for it, right? Yeah, so what we, we usually recommend there is you create a filtered report off of the main event. And you say, this new report only include people who are answered WC to question. 
And then what I would do is go back to your main report. Only those people in this report should answer no to WC or actually do not include those who have answered yes to WC. Because you also want to include everybody who didn't answer the question at all. So if you do, if you do that, it'll still be a part, technically a part of the original event, but you'll have multiple result sets. So you have your wheelchair result set and your overall result set. The question was, can you set that up beforehand? And yeah, you can totally build the report and set up the filters. So it'll all work beforehand. What do I do? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, that's a really important thing to learn how to do with race day scoring because the filtering is really um, powerful and you can build a ton of reports a thousand different ways. So um, it's very common to do exactly what you're talking about where you want to take your main results and like build a bunch of results from it. So, cause you can combine those events together but you can't separate them out unless you do this filtering. So my corrals or teams aren't the same on race day scoring and run sign up. So these are two areas that we have a limited capability currently to sync with and run sign up. Run sign up isn't like perfect. They have a really good API, which is how we like sync stuff between us and them. But there's some areas that they don't have quite as much capability. Corrals is one of them. So corrals with run sign up, there's no ability for any software out there right now today to be able to create or edit corrals on run sign up through software. So you have to do those things on run sign up. So in race day scoring, if you add corrals or if you change corrals, that information never gets up to run sign up because it's a limitation right now. So we have this on our, on our deck, it's coming up in another couple of weeks probably where we'll be able to do all this stuff. But for now, usually it's the case with corrals that you don't need the registration information updated necessarily. You really just need like the race day stuff, right? So you can go ahead and add all the corrals you need, but you just can't update existing data on run sign up for the old for the records right now. And we know this is something that some people like to see. Make sure you have all your corrals up to date after the race is over, but it's kind of a limitation. Similarly, Teams has a, a limitation with the ability to uh, we can't see that a team has been deleted from run sign up and we can't delete teams on run sign up, but that one's getting fixed in an update next week. Yeah, sorry, Roger. I'm going too <laughs> slow here. Big one is results not pushing to run sign up. Most common error is that the run results has been deleted. All you have to do if this happens, just go to the auto save and change the results set drop to a new one. Um, sometimes it can happen if someone else deletes it on run sign up. Um, Another common one is you have participant sync disabled. We have to make sure that when you are publishing results, you're also syncing participant data. So you can just go to participant sync, enable it, and you'll be good to go. Finally, if you're getting these any errors about custom field IDs being invalid, try going into your auto save and just saving it again to see if it will correct it. If that doesn't work, delete the auto save, save it again, see if that fixes it. If that doesn't work, I usually suggest go to your scored events, save scored events. That will regenerate all of your fields and then try it again. And that usually will be the last thing that will fix it. Now, if you get these errors, send us a support ticket because it's probably a weird little bug and we can fix it. But um, if you have that happen, let us know exactly what you did and we'll try to recreate it. Usually we can, but it's really helpful if you get any of these kind of weird error things that you had to like force something through to fix, let us know. Yeah, good question. It's a good question. If you delete an auto save, it'll say, do you want to delete the results that are already there? Yes or no. Um, so you can delete the results that are there or you can leave them there. If you leave them there and you create the new auto save, it'll automatically pick the one that's out there. So that's totally possible too. They can be to the same one if you wanted to, but I wouldn't suggest it. They're, they're the same concept. Basically, I would only use quick publish if you just need to do it once. End of the day, set up quick publish, click it, you're done. Auto save is you set it up at the beginning of the day and it goes throughout. 
All right. Think you're good, Roger. Shoot, yeah. Yeah, you can, if you need to make a correction for someone weeks out, I would definitely, I always back up the final one and say final, final V2, three, three, final. Um, and then use that as my, like, that's my um, last backup to use. And I delete it from my computer. And then I just go back to a cloud one if I need it, or I leave it on there. It's up to you. Yeah. Yep. All right. Some uh, quick news about race director. So it was in, uh, 2015 that I joined Run Sign Up and with the idea that, you know, I've got this uh, software here and I got lots of people dependent on it and I need to taper out of it so, you know, at some point. So Run Sign Up was kind enough to uh, take me on. And, uh, and one thing I love about Run Sign Up is uh, we can, we're, all of us are very transparent. So what I say is, what I know about run sign up and I'm never afraid to say it. So it's kind of a constant negotiation with me and Bob. Um, my, my salary is starting to decline based on an agreement between the two of us because I'm trying to back out a little bit, spend less time. My work week is uh, support on weekends. So I'm, I'm your race director support, but I'm also uh, race day scoring support. So. Uh, the race day scoring team has been kind enough to let me help with the design. I do a lot of the testing for race day scoring. So probably if you were a race director user and you learned race day scoring, you recognize a lot of the components of race director that have come into race day scoring. So anyway, um, the official line is race director will be supported through the end of next year. Um, but I expect that that may go longer. Um, more in, a, in the light of a, it's not technically supported, but Roger's still here. And so, uh, you know, the, the company has been kind enough to let me dictate a lot of this. And right now I still love the support and, and I like uh, how race day support, race day scoring support is going as well, because my contention and Alan Jones and I are, are pretty good friends and we we have the same philosophy you know the software is kind of a commodity but what keeps people coming back on software support so it's always been a big um thing for me um <laughs> bob referenced there's some geniuses in this company with technology and if you want to get a laugh out of them just ask them if i'm one of them yeah so <laughs> so um so uh, new features, I, I have not been told to not put new features in, but the understanding is um, really new features are gonna be limited. Uh, Non-binary was a good one. Um, I happen to use gender X for co-ed team relay. So adding gender X for everybody wasn't that big of a change in race director. I ended up implementing it that way. But the next big thing that comes along, um, I'm certainly, I would certainly have to ask permission, but chances are, if it's gonna be covered in race day scoring, it's not gonna get into race director. So, um, it, you know, it, you know, obviously it already is in a bug fix mode, so I'll certainly fix any bugs that are there, but uh, really I'm gonna be adding a whole lot of new features. But one thing that I have done is for components of race director that, may not be ready yet in race day scoring and are extractable, I'm starting to build some standalone applications that you can use whether you've been a race director customer or not. And that, I was gonna go over those right now. So um, there's five of them and I'll show you some screenshots. I'll be in the demo room this afternoon if you wanna see any of these. Um, <clears throat> when you go to the, your timer, um, when your timer dashboard, it's under software uh, installs and it's way at the bottom and it's that button way over there at the right race day scoring utilities. First one is um, 
results kiosk. So race director has always had a results kiosk that runs on standalone computers and is connected to live results so that can people can come up, enter their bib number, see their results. And the key thing is print to a label printer. Some timers have that really embedded into their business. Um, you know, the, this race example is a, is a 100% race day scoring customer right now that still needs this. They've, they want to have the ability to use the brother printer uh, printout of the uh, re result ticket. Race, race day scoring will have this natively at some point in time, but right now this is handy for that. So the, this works, so the, the source of the race setup, if you will, can be one of two places, race day scoring or race director. From race day scoring, it doesn't even need to be a full export, just the setup only. Results source are, <clears throat> maybe you're at a remote location with no internet, so you can pull it directly from your scoring either race director or race day scoring uh, through a network, or the most common is pulling the results from RSU. So as race director or race day scoring are publishing, the kiosk is pulling it from run sign up. Okay, if you're a time machine user, um, this is, uh, I'm testing this pretty heavily with a race day scoring customer right now. They want to use their time machines. Um, so if you, um, so you're connected to your time machine, somebody's on the keypad, the results are coming in and maybe the operator of this little app is at the finish line putting in the bib numbers or verifying the bib numbers. So you can put the, the grid of times that uh, are coming from the time machine into edit mode and make any changes you want. And as you're making the changes, the times are still coming from the time machine. And they're going out to immediately to a file that you can use as uh, either a primary or backup stream. Um, it's, you know, very often time machine data is a backup to your um, to your chip system, but in a small race, this might be um, something you'd want to use. This will definitely get obsoleted as you get to learn the new, um, uh, what are we calling it? Yeah, yeah, the, the, app, the timer app, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you were a race director user and you use the little component of race director called PC timer, that's a separate app now, operates exactly. Put that output to a file and you can make that a stream in race day scoring. <clears throat> I know a lot of timers have time machines. So this, this one is, or, or a, lot of, a lot of timers have used this application. So this is a... Uh, uh, the other, the other component of another component of race director is the bib chip assignment process, um, especially if you're connecting to things like the IPCO registration reader, or if you want to connect right to your chip system to scan the chips in. These are mostly like for MyLab Pro chip or, or um, you know, some of the like uh, Trident and IPCO and even race result have a lot of a lot of times just meaningless looking. Uh, chip codes, but if you're familiar with race director and chip assignments, that screen looks familiar, now it, it can be run as a separate app. The last one is more for maybe our internal use as developers, but uh, replay. A lot of middleware like uh, timing and scoring have the ability to replay the reads just as if you know, you're at the, at the finish line. This could be useful for training. Uh, other systems like IPCO and Trident and others don't have a replay. So we use this in our testing. Uh, we want to see, in re like for an announcer feed, we want to see in real time what it, the data looks like coming through a TCP IP connection. And this one actually, <clears throat> there's two versions of it. One that mimics going through a TCP IP stream or, an, or another one, I want to mimic it actually going to a file and reading, reading from a file. So probably this one doesn't have as much use, but, uh, but that's, I think that's the last one. All right.
So yeah, so after you install them, after you install them, that's what it'll look like here on your desktop. Yeah. yeah. Pardon me. So bib chip is yeah, that's that one right there. So that's like going into race director, going under end results, chip systems, chip assignments. And and you may not you may not use chip assignments very often. I don't. I don't it's know. it's typical for uh, IPCO and Trident timers yeah. to use, yeah. where they they have chip codes that are like one two three X Y Z four five six, and they need to say this is chip bib one. The next one I scan is bib two. The next one is bib three. So it's it's really useful for pro chip, IPCO, Trident, right. anything where it's like an alphanumeric. Right. Yeah, if if you're an IPCO user, that's that's what your chip code looks like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Cool. I'll any, be in the demo room this afternoon if you want to see any of that. Any other questions, Penny? Oh no, yeah. Yeah, totally. There's a lot of limitations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh the oh the the, the, the bib assignment the stuff. Yeah. It's it's super yeah. limited. I, I we've gotten a lot of requests on that. I I I'm I don't know, maybe I'm old school, but I just always go to a spreadsheet, sort the way I want it and upload it. Like <laughs> Like that's just what I tell people, and I know it's a workaround, but that's just what I'm used to doing. Like I love getting my spreadsheet, start by this, start then by this, then by this, and just plug it in, push it up. This is like, I know it's not a, it's a kind of a cop out, but that is what I always will tell people right now. I agree, and we have that one. We have a long, <clears throat> sorry, we have an issue with a bunch of different ways that we could add different sorts, and it's on a list for our developers to take as like a Monday item. Um, cause it wouldn't be that hard, but we just, you know, it's a nice to have, um, there's a lot of other, uh, big, big, big things that run sign up is working on, unfortunately. Oh yeah. I hear you. There are some other questions in the back maybe. Yeah. Eric. Um, probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's like close it and reopen it to force it. Yeah, yeah, we could probably add something like that. That'd be easy. It's a good one. Thank you. There. Is there a reason to not have? So as I'm going down, and yeah. I just finally figured it out. Started my races. Sure. They're all on race day scoring. Yeah. Is there any reason to put some on the cloud? That, that the race yeah. The question was, um, I heard it said that um, there's times you should clear out your database because if you have too many races, it could get slow. I think that was. We had some issues with like a bug where um, a timer had some really, really, really old database files from like yeah. versions back, like version one dot something. And it caused a, a, a bug, which like his database kind of crashed. And we kind of just said that, you know, we sh you shouldn't really keep around really, really, really old versions of scoring result files in there because there are Usually when we do, like we're on race, direct, or race day scoring version three, dot whatever, dot whatever. If we go from like one to two to three, that means it's a major, major, major update. And there may be things that go wrong on older versions. We don't do that very often, um, but it, it's, I think that was more along the lines of if you have very, very, very old race files, you may run into a database corruption issue. Like, you know, with Roger, with race director, if you use race director, you know, sometimes you'll get like a corrupted database file and it won't be able to import. 
it's the same kind of thing. So uh, I would say it's not going to slow down your computer if you have a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, it's not a problem usually. Uh, I like personally to have a clean computer that I send out to races. And then my office computer will have archive. That's what I do. Just because it's easier for the timer. They don't have to worry about it. They just go and load the race that's in there. They're good to go. I wipe it. It's just a process thing that makes sense to me. And then you don't have like computers out there with halfway done races or like old versions. Because you know how it is. You go to make a correction. You're like, oh yeah, that race is on this laptop. I'll make it from here. And then you didn't realize that someone corrected it else. So I like to just wipe it, keep everything backed up to the cloud. Yeah, Steve. I noticed um, sometimes when I'm like, data refreshes and it kicks me out of the screen. Someone, so yeah. So, this has been. Yeah. We've, we've had this happen. We've had this reported where people say that it's refreshing as they're trying to edit something in a participant screen. And like, we haven't been able to replicate it because we, I think we talked about this before. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I, I know. I so, I, I yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so you so, think it happens more with the connector it running? Only one connector. Running? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I because we brought this up on a dev call before, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. But you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll try. And, I heard it this in symposium twice already. I haven't heard it before that. So like, thank. Honestly, thank you both for telling us because we'll we'll get it, we'll we'll trap it and we'll see what's going on. But that shouldn't happen. That's not normal. No, no, no. That's one of those things. Like, please let us know about because it shouldn't. Be, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us. Just submit the help ticket. Say this isn't like urgent, but no. just yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing this when I do this. That's perfect, and we'll fix it. Yeah. So question is, do I need to worry about progress reports or anything like that when I'm publishing results? Um, I guess I would say one thing that we do with race day scoring is if it's a multi-segment race, more than one segment, we automatically set up the reports for you to show non-finishers. So it will show in progress, like the triathletes. So you know, runners on run sign up or participants on run sign up will show their progress out there. And it'll show everybody who hasn't finished yet um, just at the bottom of the sheet, sorted by the number of seconds completed first. Yep. Yeah. So as soon as they get reads or as soon as they get results out there, um, if you are doing finish line notifications, just finish notifications, it's triggered based on the clock time. If it's, if you're doing splits notifications as well, they're triggered whenever they hit the, the split. All right, I think we gotta wrap up. All right. All right, thanks everyone. Talk to you later.